Welcome to Practice Update. I'm Jason Sloan, and I'm here with Dr. Jack Leahy. He's going to help us talk a little bit about the new diabetes treatments. First question I have for you is, what do we know about the novel GLP-1 glucagon receptor dual agonist from preclinical and clinical trials in terms of mechanism of action, safety profile, uh, and overall effects on weight and glycemic control? Yeah, Jason, it's a pleasure. So we're reasonably comfortable now with the GLP-1 receptor agonist world. We've learned a lot about it. We have clinical drugs and, uh, you know, their profiles are pretty spectacular. But it turns out in biology that when glucagon is broken down in the gut, what comes out of part of the GI tract is not just GLP-1, but is something called oxint oxintomodulin. And what that is is a combination of GLP-1, but also a combination of glucagon. And it actually turns out the glucagon in addition to the GLP-1 serves an interesting role because what the glucagon seems to add to that is a better reduction in weight, a better energy utilization, a better satiety effect. So there's been great interest based on preclinical data, mostly uh, to start with animal models, of creating these hybrid proteins, which you can do in a laboratory, mm -hmm. and you get a GLP-1 and you get glucagon, you put it together and you start studying what happens. And, and the data in mice and even in non-human primates is pretty profound in that you get better reductions in weight than you would with GLP-1 alone, that you get uh, no difference in hypoglycemia, that you get uh, a reduction in hepatic glucose production, even uh, improvement in insulin secretion is kind of the standard data that's seen. And so the hope is that that will translate into humans, and there are beginning to be some human trials. And in fact, some of these have actually progressed through pharma into phase two. Um, and so we'll start to see real human data in terms of testing all of the specifics. But at least what the human trials are starting to suggest is clearly an impact of these drugs to reduce weight, to improve insulin secretion, to have a low rate of hypoglycemia, relatively few side effects. And I think the important question that needs to be solved is whether the hybrid protein is measurably better than a GLP-1 agonist alone. And that's where we're really waiting to see where this class will evolve in the future. That's very exciting. Some of the newer diabetes medications along the same line of thought uh, have been shown to significantly reduce uh, diabetes-related complications such as chronic kidney disease, um, heart disease, uh, things like that. I was wondering if you could speak about the evidence regarding the impact of newer drugs on uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and whether or not there's a benefit there of certain medications. Well, this is uh, a really important topic because I think everyone has come to the realization over the last five or more years that an enormous health care issue which is exploding around us is the evolution of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease into a very small proportion of patients to eventually cirrhosis, fibrosis, and end-stage liver disease. Anybody who talks to their local gastroenterologist will hear the story that the dominant effect they are now seeing in terms of liver disease in many places and the need for liver transplant is related to this sequence. It's a, it's a complicated sequence mm -hmm. because about 70% of people with obesity with diabetes will have fat in the liver but it ends up being a very, very small portion of those people who will eventually end up at the end stages with really clinical disease. And that in many ways begins to address the question you're asking. Because what we know is that GLP-1 drugs and SGLT2 inhibitors, there's data supporting that use of those drugs will lower liver fat. The same way data from many years ago showing the thiazolidine dilons are actually pretty potent drugs at lowering liver fat. The real issue will be with time is will it actually impact the number of people who go on to end stage liver disease and at what stage of the disease, if you have hepatitis, if you have fibrosis, can you use any of these drugs and reverse some of the problems and get people to a healthy liver? That's still, still really early in the evolution of that data, and part of it's technical. I mean, in many ways, you can't answer these questions without proper technology, which is often biopsies, and those are complicated studies to do. So I think where we are right now is there is hope because we know they will lower liver fat, that in the long run they will be useful drugs, but how we end up eventually targeting patients and using these drugs is still really an evolving issue. Fantastic. We'll have to keep an eye out for that. There's also some uh, discussion of potentially adding uh, 
some oral agents to the treatment of people with type 1 diabetes. I was wondering if you would comment on the use of SGLT2 inhibitors and their utility and efficacy in treating uh, type 1 diabetes along with insulin. Well, this is actually a fairly hot topic now. The reason simply is that like type 2, patients with type 1 diabetes struggle, struggle with weight and metabolic disease. And in fact, one of the big observations in studies that are looking at teenagers with type 1 diabetes and people in their 20s is there has been an evolving increase in terms of obesity and metabolic disease, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, all of the things we think about. So we're beginning to think about drugs that might actually be used in type 1 diabetes in combination with insulin programs to be metabolic beneficial drugs. And one of those classes of drugs are SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, it turns out there's a New England Journal paper from 2017 which is kind of a proof of principle paper reporting on a drug called sotagliflozin. It is an SGLT2 inhibitor, but it's a very special drug because it's not only an inhibitor of SGLT2, but it's also an inhibitor and in part of SGLT1, a very different transporter that's in the gut, so it tends to lower postprandial glucose as a bit of an added benefit for these drugs. But what that, what that paper showed was some weight reduction a small reduction in levels of hemoglobin A1C, and a pretty good safety profile in patients with type 1 diabetes. Now virtually every SGLT2 inhibitor company has ongoing programs to test the use of their drugs in type 1 diabetes. And there's a lot of exciting early information to suggest similar benefits. Reductions in A1C, modest. Reductions in weight, that's important. Blood pressure improvements, really the things we're looking for to be used in addition for insulin programs in our patients with type 1 diabetes. Thank you. Speaking of uh, advancements and exciting um, potential new therapies, I was wondering if you'd be willing to comment on emerging therapies for type 1 diabetes, such as uh, beta, beta cell or islet transplantation and where we are with all of that. Well, the hope eventually is to have a therapy which will cure the disease, and to cure a disease where beta cells are gone, you have to give them back. Pancre whole pancreas transplantation has been around really since the 60s and 70s and continues to be a used therapy and pretty successful, frankly, but it's a big deal. So islet transplantation has really been the concept of something which might be technically easier, maybe a little easier from immunosuppression point of view, with information 20 years ago that suggested we were well along our way for successful islet transplantation. And anyone who knows this field will know that we ran into some significant roadblocks, including uh, much less discussion about successful islet transplantation. That's changed. And there are, in fact, a number of centers around the world that are doing very successful islet transplants, but in many ways it's still a very small therapy given the number of people with this disease and I don't think one can easily look at it and think it can be expanded all that much because of the lack of availability of islets. That's really our problem. So what's happened is that the field has changed to stem cell therapy and we've talked about stem cell therapy for probably 20 years but within about the last five or six or seven years Stem cell, stem cell therapy has hugely evolved to the point where many laboratories around the world can reproducibly create pretty healthy beta cells from stem cells in a test tube and transplant them back into animal models. And we're really at the doorstep of clinical trials, which will begin of using different kinds of stem cell approaches to do human trials and see where we end up. And I think this is uh, one of the most exciting things that's ongoing. That's great news. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Leahy, and thank you all for joining us at Practice Update.